next uh, uh, poster talk is uh, Logan Crew. His wife mentioned is married to our previous speaker, Sof Sophie Sprickle, and they're co-authors of the deletion contraction relation for the chromatic symmetric function. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. Uh, thank you all for being here today, and thanks for setting this up. And like was mentioned, I'm working with the chromatic symmetric function. This is co-authored with Sophie, which means it's going to be about graphs. So let's briefly go over what a graph is. It is a set of vertices or points and a set of edges. So in this, for this particular example, I am using a graph of major airports and flight routes by a particular airline. This graph is going to be called Delta, and I will be referencing it. So, a second, there we go. And so, if we're going to be doing edge deletion contraction, let me briefly explain to you what exactly that means. On the one hand, if we start with this edge between Minneapolis and San Antonio, we could just delete it, just remove it from the graph. That's pretty straightforward. It's usually denoted by this backslash. Alternatively, we can contract it. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, my contraction will not necessarily reduce it to simple graphs, unless I say otherwise. So as in this example, we still have two edges between Atlanta and our unexpected city of Min Antonio, since there was one from Atlanta to both endpoints of that edge. And that's denoted by a forward slash. What's interesting about this, the chromatic polynomial is the polynomial function that satisfies that chi g of n for all positive integers in is the number of in colorings of the graph, where in colorings mean that it's a proper coloring. All colorings in this talk are proper, unless I say otherwise, meaning that they assign different positive integers to each vertex on either side of an edge. And in coloring means that it uses only integers one through n. And we have this well-known theorem that chi g of x decomposes as chi of g delete e minus chi of g contract e. A very nice formula. It allows for lots of nice properties to be proven on the chromatic polynomial using induction, for example, on the number of edges, since both of these graphs on the right-hand side have fewer edges. We want to apply this to the chromatic symmetric function. So what is that? We use the capital X g to denote that it's kind of a generalization. And this is going to be a sum over all proper colorings of the graph. And for each proper coloring, we're going to assign it a monomial, where the exponent of x sub i is going to be the number of vertices that get the color i in the graph. So it's going to be x1 to the number of ones, x2 to the number of twos. And it's slightly more general than the chromatic polynomial, since we now learn the breakdown of how the colors are distributed, instead of just the fact that it is a coloring. It's a power series. It is a symmetric function because you can permute the indices and it's going to remain unchanged because the permutation of any proper coloring is still a proper coloring. And it generalizes the chromatic polynomial because if we just set the first n variables to one, then this counts for exactly once each proper n coloring. So as an example of how we compute this, if we have this coloring on the left, where we have three blue vertices representing the color one, and one green and one red, this particular coloring is giving us this term x1 cubed x2 x3. Whereas this one on the right has two of color one and two of color two. So this coloring gives an x1 squared x2 squared x3. So like I was mentioning, these are both proper three colorings. They're essentially treated the same by the chromatic polynomial, but they're treated differently by the chromatic symmetric function. And then this illustrates kind of what's going on with that. One thing this does not have is a deletion contraction relation. Um, the deletion contraction relation, the problem with that is every term in the chromatic symmetric function has monomials with a total exponent of the variables equal to the number of vertices, just by definition. When you contract an edge, this reduces the number of vertices. So x of g contract e would be some function on n of degree n minus 1. And there's not a really good way to fix that in general. There have been attempts made, and there are various kind of um, modular relations, but not a true deletion contraction relation. Uh, Sophie and I are going to fix this by introducing a vertex weight. We're assigning each vertex a positive integer weight. And the definition now changes by simply 
taking each vertex and its corresponding coloring, but we input the x variable equal to the weight of the vertex. So if we color a vertex one and it has weight three, that vertex contributes x1 cubed to the overall monomial. So this will mean that the total weight of the monomials produced is going to be the sum of the vertex weights of the graph. And that is something that we can make be a fixed value much more easily. How we're going to do that is when we contract a graph, by, when we contract an edge in the graph, we're going to add the weights of the endpoints of the edge. And the new vertex is going to get the sum of those weights. If we do that, then we have a deletion contraction relation that functions essentially like the chromatic polynomial does. We have an xgw, it'll be equal to xg delete ew minus xg contract e with this contracted weight function. So to briefly illustrate how this works, I'm going to do it from the other way around and start with xg delete e and illustrate that if we have a coloring here with these vertex weights, so here the colors don't correspond to these numbers, these numbers are vertex weights. But if I have some binomial corresponding to this term, that also comes from this term because in the graph G, since the colors of these endpoints are different, it's just a coloring on G. Now, if the colors of the endpoints of this edge are the same, then this doesn't give us a coloring on XG, but it does give us a coloring on XG contract E with this obvious contraction. And this vertex contributes weight five to the green variable, the same degree five it's contributed from this three and this two. So that illustrates how there's the one-to-one -one bijection between monomials of xg delete e and one of either g or g contract e. And this adding the vertex weights makes those terms be the same. This has a lot of nice applications that make things work nicely. And I'm going to share briefly the one that is perhaps one of the most interesting, which is so sorry, could, so sorry to interrupt. Could you show the two examples just before? So the coloring changed in the deletion contraction or? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, yes, this illustrates that each monomial that comes from this graph G delete E comes from exactly one of these two. Right, if these, if these two vertices have different colors, then you get the same monomial from G. And if they have a proper coloring where they could give the same color, then that corresponds to one coloring on G contract E, and the monomials are going to have the same degrees because the vertex weights are contributing to that term the same amount. Yeah, does, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And so, one of um, Richard Stanley originally introduced the chromatic symmetric function, and one of one of his um, nicest results, arguably, is result is a result on acyclic orientations of a graph. So we assign an orientation to a graph by assigning a direction to each edge. A sink is then going to be any vertex with no out edges. An isolated vertex then is also a sink. Mm -hmm. So e lambdas are one of the basis of bases of symmetric functions. Uh, I won't define them here, but they're fairly straightforward. But the point is that we can write any symmetric function uniquely as a sum of the of a, as a linear combination of these e lambdas. If you do this, then Stanley showed that the number of acyclic orientations of G is the sum of those coefficients. And this is, in some sense, just a generalization of this formula for the chromatic polynomial, which is also well known. What the chromatic symmetric function does that's stronger is you can sum the C lambda over those lambda with k parts. So lambda here is an integer partition, meaning that it is a sequence of, po of non-increasing positive integers. So for example, let me briefly illustrate using this. If this green is one and this blue is two and this red is three, then that corresponds to a monomial x1 to the fifth, x2 cubed, x3. Its exponent has a partition 5, 3, 1. That is the partition, the integer partition corresponding to the weights of these color classes. That's what these lambdas are representing. And so if you sum only those coefficients in the E lambda basis where lambda has exactly k different numbers, k different parts, that gives you the number of acyclic orientations of G with exactly k sinks. And with our method, we can generalize this to vertex weighted graphs. There are many other identities that can be generalized, and some of those are at the end of these slides that I probably won't get to. 
but this is one where we're going to take a fixed acyclic orientation of our graph. I'm calling it gamma. We look at its sink vertices and we define a sink map off of gamma to be a map on all the vertices of the graph that assigns a set of positive integers. That set is contained in the numbers one up through the weight of the vertex for each vertex separately. And we wanted to have the property that it assigns every vertex the empty set unless it's a sink, in which case it assigns it a non-empty set. Intuitively, what we're doing here is how we're counting acyclic orientations with k sinks is we're viewing a vertex of weight, we'll say four, as having four miniature vertices plugged into that vertex. And when, we get, and when it's a sink, we choose some of those vertices to be sinks that contribute to our terms. So if we have n vertices, our total weight is d, and we have this uh, chromatic symmetric function expansion, then we still have an interpretation of the sum over those lambda with k parts of these coefficients. We have a fixed sign that's just the excess weight of the graph, hence the minus one to the total weight more than one per vertex. And instead of counting each acyclic orientation once, we count pairs of acyclic orientations paired with a sync map. And when we're looking at those lambda with k parts, we look at only those s such that the sum of the cardinalities of those subsets is size k. So we're still looking at acyclic orientations with k sinks, but in the sense that we are choosing those k sinks from L less than or equal to k vertices and choosing many vertices out of them to get a total of k. And each of these pairs is not counted as one necessarily. It's counted as one or minus one, depending on whether the number of mini sinks, depending on the parity of the mini sinks minus the number of actual sinks in the graph. And you can check that in the case that d equals n, everything is the same as in the original formula by Stanley because this s is only going to be the um, trivial assignment for each sink it gets uh, the subset one. And so this will just sum over each acyclic orientation once. And I'll give a very brief sketch of how this is proved, but the nice aspect of this is the proof is also different. The proof by Stanley of the acyclic orientation construction uses an algebraic um, argument on um, essentially chromatic quasi-symmetric functions on posets induced by a fixed orientation and some algebraic machinery. This proof is just by induction on the number of edges. It's essentially a raw structural proof. We end up wanting to show this relation after we apply induction, the base case, and do some simplifying, where you'll note that g delete e ended up on the left because of how some of the sign changes worked out. So to show this, we would fix an acyclic orientation. We would fix of g delete e, and we would fix a sync map of g delete e, and then we would, we would show that this holds by considering that fixed acyclic orientation in S on g delete e. We take the two on g that correspond to it because we have to add in the extra edge again and assign it one way or the other. And then we have the one on the g contract e, which we, which we want to check if it remains acyclic. And we want to check in all of these cases if S remains a valid sync map. And if it does, we count minus one to the number of sinks. So almost finished here, but I'll briefly show one case of this. All right, I'll very briefly sketch this out. So this is an example where we have a directed path between the endpoints of E. In that case, there's one sink, and that sink is assigned the total set one, two, three, and this is on G delete E. And G contract E, this is invalid because there's a cycle, no longer acyclic. This is valid, and it still works. This is invalid because it's not acyclic. So we had one term on G, and we had one term on G delete E, and they had the same number of sinks, so our thing checks out for those orientations coming from this particular acyclic orientation and sink map. And you can check basically as a case-by-case -case basis that this works for all of these possible cases. It's a proof of this that just uses that. Uh, and I'm seeing a question in the chat. And I'll read the question briefly. So it's on here. Have you considered an analog of your theorem where the, uh, with length of lambda, the number of parts of lambda? Uh, what exactly do you mean? This is, um, let me see. The sum is over the length, over um, lambda has k parts. 
so it's the so it is a sum over those c lambda where k is the length of lambda. I think I might not be understanding your question. Is the the sum is uh, general over all lambdas, but uh, the coefficient of t to the k is what you're considering. So if you say, but oh, uh, this make turn but, this t. But here you have. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we've considered that specifically. We we have looked at the um, the bad coloring chromatic symmetric function, which is the if you know the p basis expansion of the chromatic symmetric function, the one where you end up putting a t in mm -hmm. where this naturally would go. We have tried to work out a extension of this theorem in that case, something along that line. We have not yet found something to work. It seems like there should be one, but it's more complicated than I've been able to work with yet. We can try this, this particular formula with T though and see how that works. I don't know if we've just done this one specifically. Yeah. And like I said, I have other slides, but I know I'm out of time and you can view those if you want. They have some more examples and um, a link to our paper. They're on the website as well, yes. Yeah, maybe it's good just to go ahead and um, go to those last slides. Um. Sure. So this is, this would be another one of these cases where we would check some more of the casework. And here's some more results. So this is just saying there's a P lambda basis on which the usual chromatic symmetric function extends naturally. Mm -hmm. And this is generalizing um, how the involution affects the chromatic symmetric function. And both of these are proven by induction on the number of edges again, <clears throat> as opposed to the traditional proofs, which usually aren't inductive. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think that's very nice. Let's give uh, Logan a quick round of applause and maybe we can. <laughs>